and we're live on YouTube. Okay. And we're recording as well. There we are. So uh, the time is 19.05. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody. I hope you've all had a lovely, safe, satisfying summer with some aspects of life going back to some kind of normality. Uh, the society's summer hiatus is now over, which means lectures and activities are starting up again, though for the moment they remain online only. Uh, before we start properly, just like to remind everyone again that we are recording and live streaming to the public via YouTube. The recording will be available later on for viewing with no time limit. Please remember to keep your microphones on mute, but feel free to have video on if you wish. In fact, it can be helpful for the guest speaker to be able to see the audience and on a less formal note, it helps everyone to feel like we're all in the same room together. Those of you who are on Zoom, you can resize and rearrange your Zoom window as you like, uh, as well as change it from speaker view to gallery view. You can do all that with the little view button up in somewhere in the top right of the screen. It looks like a grid icon. Those changes will only affect your screen. They won't show up to anybody else and they won't show up on the recording. So you can do them as you like. And remember as well that you've also got your reaction buttons in Zoom, your thumbs up, your smiley faces, that kind of thing. So feel free to use them. Uh, if you've got any questions for the speaker, please write them clearly in the chat box. If you're on Zoom and it's not visible already, you can display it by clicking the chat icon, which looks like a little speech bubble. That's usually found along the bottom of the screen. Or if you're on a smaller device, you might have to tap the screen first or click on the three dots where it says more. If you're watching on YouTube, the chat box is usually displayed by default along the right hand side on larger screens or below the video on smaller screens. Uh, whichever way you're doing it, please prefix your questions with a big letter Q so that they stand out amongst all the other chat because we have to sift through it all and it helps us to find them. Uh, when it comes to the Q&A, we'll go around the room and you can either read your question out yourself or one of us can read it out for you if you, if you prefer. So the society is now in its 140th year and I'm extremely proud that we've made it this far. We've survived two world wars, several flu pandemics, and to date, this pandemic, I'm also extremely proud of our membership for the grace and patience that they've shown. This past year and a half has not been an easy time for anybody, and to those of you who have lost loved ones, please accept our deepest sympathies and condolences. So, without further ado, please allow me to welcome our members, including those of you who are still waiting to join officially, our guest viewers, both here and on YouTube, and our guest speaker to the September 2021 meeting of the Liverpool Astronomical Society. Okay, right, onto the agenda. <laughs> First of all, and before we uh, before I read the agenda, I should point out uh, I'm standing in as chair this evening, uh, as we've got a few members of council away who normally do the chair duties. Uh, so. Item number one on the agenda, apologies for absence. I've received apologies from Brendan Martin, Jared Gilligan, Zoltan Gregus, Rob Johnson, and Steve Southern. Item number two, minutes of the previous monthly meeting, which was held back in uh, Friday the 21st of May, 2021. Uh, as we've been doing for, throughout the whole pandemic, we're taking a temporary break from reading out the minutes of that meeting, but they are available on request. Uh, if you want a copy of them, just send an email to me um, on society.secretary at liverpoolas.org. Okay, item number three on the agenda would be the acceptance of the minutes. And um, again, as per the past 18 months, uh, they've been sort of accepted by council. Uh, item number four, new members. Again, another one that we can't really do at the moment. Uh, so we will move on from that. We do currently have 50 people waiting to join the society uh, who are unable to. So we're hoping to bring them in <laughs> as soon as we can. Item number five, announcements. Okay, so um, the first and the one that everyone is 
I'm sure eager to hear is the current COVID situation and what's happening with reopening and restarting things in the society. So we're very aware that members are eager to get back to the Quaker Meeting House and to observing sessions at Leighton Observatory. Um, we're also extremely aware that we're long overdue an AGM. We're closely monitoring the situation in terms of infection rates, how risks can be minimised, what constitutes a safe risk versus an unsafe risk. For example, should we allow some kind of limited reopening for very small numbers of members only? Um, whether double vaccination should be required, whether a negative same day lateral flow test should be required, whether face masks and hand sanitizer should be mandatory and so on. As I'm sure you can imagine, these are not easy decisions to make and we must err on the side of caution for the majority of the members. Normally over the summer break period, we have a break from council meetings too, but during the pandemic, these have continued with the primary topic being our roadmap to reopening. During August, we were optimistically looking at this October for some sort of return to the QMH, but the most recent decision made by Council a couple of days ago on Wednesday the 16th uh, was to defer that for another month, with November now being the earliest date. And this is, of course, still subject to change. If the infection rates increase the way they did that time last year, we'll probably have to defer again, but we're, we're taking it as it comes. Uh, I know this is not the news that you've all waited and hoped for, but we have to put safety first. On a positive note, at least it is looking like there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, next announcement is uh, people who wish to stand for council. So first of all, I must point out that this item only applies to those of you who are already paid up members as of our last me meeting in the QMH back in March 2020. Uh, so if you're one of the 50 on the waiting list, then you, you can't actually stand for council at this point. You have to wait a, a year before you can from being an official member. Uh, so to the rest, to, to the paid up members, we can at least now start to hopefully plan for an AGM. So start having to think about whether you would like to apply for council, what you, you know, might, might bring to the table. Bear with me one second. Sorry, we've got some late comers, so I've got, just got to let them in. Um, <laughs> bear with me. If I could... Uh, can I make you co-host, Dave Galvin? And if you could let people in from the waiting room, just... Uh, there we go. Right. Sorry about that. So, uh, yeah, if, if uh, you think you could do some good on council, please have a think about it. Uh, so while council make our own nominations, you know, who we think might be a good fit uh, and so on, that doesn't mean you can't also stand for a position. Our nominations are just a suggestion and shouldn't be taken as a mandate. Any member of the society who meets the following criteria can stand for any position on council. If you wish to stand, you need to, one, be a fully paid up member for at least one full session immediately prior to the election taking place. Two, have another fully paid up member put you forward for nomination. And three, have another fully paid up member second that nomination and then all three of you, the one standing, the one nominating you, and the one seconding you, need to inform the secretary, which is currently me, at least one calendar month before the AGM takes place. And there's also the two junior rep positions. That works very slightly differently. Uh, it, it can be occupied by an adult member or a junior member, but it's generally only nominated and voted on by junior members if there are any av available. Now, I know this is a lot of information to take in very quickly. So if you want to review it in more detail, you can find it in the Constitution under the Office Bearers and Councillors heading, which is sections 15 through 18. And uh, if you haven't got a copy of the Constitution, you can give me a shout and I'll send you one. Next item, uh, next announcement. Pex Hill, unfortunately, was vandalised over the summer. Um, the building was damaged and I'll pass over to the director of the observatory to give you an update on what happened there. 
can't hear you. You're muted. <laughs> I love Zoom. <laughs> I know. <laughs> 18 oh, yeah. months. <laughs> I, I do two shows a week, and I, I always mute myself. I, I get sold off for it. Never mind. Um, yeah, as you say, uh, vandalism uh, during the uh, summer periods. Uh, it's been a situation since COVID and lockdown. Uh, we've not had access to the observatory, therefore we're not on site, but we haven't got that presence that we normally have. And it does make a heck of a difference because we have the security on a, on a Wednesday night, we're there on a Friday night, occasionally Tuesdays on occasional Saturday as well. And this, I think, proves you know, that we do make a difference being there. What's basically happened is um, they've gained access to the rear of the building. Um, can I share screen, Mark? Yeah. Okay, hopefully this will work. You just bear with me one second. And you have to talk me through this, Mark. Do I click on screen? Uh, yeah, you want to share the, the whole screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, with sound. With sound. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and can you tell me if you can see? I can on... see your screen. Right. Yeah. I can actually see the YouTube stream that you've got open. All right. Which is now that. going back into YouTube, which is going to create a bit of, of the feedback. That's okay. I do apologize, sir. <laughs> Well, let's get this right. <laughs> right so let's get back to that again. You have to talk me through this again, Mark. Sorry. Okay. Right. Down in the bottom of your screen. Yeah. Right. You want to click on the folder on the left where your videos and photos are. Oh, sorry. Again. Down, down to the bottom. See where down it says the... type here to search. Oh, yes. Go on to the, the right folder there. there. Yeah. Okay. Click right. on that. Yep. And then we did practice this before, but it's not something I do every day. And now I can just <laughs> select the individual images. Is that right? Yeah, just start from there. Okay, from thanks there. for everyone bearing with us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I see, I'm, I'm admitting people in the room at the same Don't time. Don't worry, I'll, I'll do that while you're doing this. <laughs> okay, right. So hopefully you can see Pexel on the screen. This is the, the front view, um, which basically didn't get any damage done to it at all. Uh, you can see the lower windows uh, at the face. These windows are also at the rear, uh, upstairs window at the rear as well, which is our library room. For those who have been to Pexel, you'll know the, the, the library. Um, we have the view out across the reservoir at the back. Um, basically, uh, they've gained access and... Um, to the ground, not to the building itself. Access to God. There was no entry to the building. That's uh, a godsend. Um, but basically, every window at the rear of the building was smashed. Uh, basically, no glass left. And it was open, but, but they did not gain access. On the rear of this, there was bars on the window, so they couldn't get in. So this is the lower classroom. Uh, the toilet area, windows were smashed. You can see the bars there. Again, made the building secure. Um, ladies' toilets and so on. The upstairs joining room between the two main rooms. On the left will be the, uh, the conservation group, who use that as an office. Uh, to the right is the entrance into our library room. Um, again, the, the windows at the back were smashed. As you open the door, uh, we can see uh, stones on the floor, which are only small stones, um, but there's glass everywhere. This is going back to, I think it was the June, um, glass uh, debris over, over the floor, over the tables, over the desk chairs. Um, quite a mess in, in this area. And this is the larger piece of, of stone. So there's a pen, which is approximately four inch, 100 mil. So it gives you an idea of the stone that was thrown through, plus the smaller ones. And they, they, they caused, un, un, you know, basically a lot of damage. What's happening now is that... Um, well, the building, first of all, was open to the elements for three or four days. Um, lucky enough, the rain wasn't heavy. Um, nobody gained entrance because the, the room's actually high up above ground level. Uh, also, um, we think something has climbed through the windows, whether it be a bird or a, a rodent, perhaps a squirrel or something, and has not been able to get out. It's died. Unfortunately, there's been flies uh, who've laid eggs and you can imagine the consequences of flies laying eggs on a bit of a carcass. Uh, anybody who's having their food at this moment and is a little bit queasy, maybe a thousand flies in a room, I suggest you look away from the, look away from the screen or at least uh, turn your video camera off. Um, there is a bit of audio. There's no expletives, I hope. Um, this is actually me and Chris entering into the room. The, the first entrance into the room we were actually dropping a telescope off that was donated and the room that we would have put it in would have been this lower room. Um, when we opened the door, there was literally 
somewhere in the region of a thousand flies. The room was closed quickly. Myself and Noel went back downstairs and discussed the situation. What can we do? Uh, a little bit later on the, in the day, Chris Banks came up and joined me. Uh, Noel had to get off. And uh, me and Chris opened the door uh, and basically just let go with two cans of fly spray. Uh, basically, we used half a can, closed the door, waited 20 minutes. Uh, a lot of the flies died. Some of them escaped out the room and we had to sort of like vacate them through, um, uh, uh, what could you say, it was like a, a safety lock system where we moved them from one room to another on the landing and out of a window. A bit more complicated than it sounds. So I'll just move forward and I do apologise. Again, lots of flies. Uh, this is a still image above the window. This window was open to the, alley, uh, to the elements and that's where something may have got in. I've got to be honest and say when the door was initially opened, there was no smell, nothing rotten at all. Um, whatever was there has probably gone, been eaten away. And all those maggots have obviously hatched. For every fly, you must have a maggot, I guess. Uh, I don't know the life cycle of a fly. But um, consequences are there was lots of flies resulted from it. Uh, slightly to the right, you can see again along the side, they're on the bookshelves. And, th and these are actually just hanging there. I don't know why they sit there. As I walked into the room, they decide to fly around. So the video that you're about to see is 20 minutes after we sprayed the room. We reduced a lot of, a lot of the flies down to um, maybe two thirds of the amount. We did that three or four times over a four hour period, uh, which we now believe uh, we haven't been back in. We're not that brave yet. Uh, we're going back tomorrow dinner time to have a look. Um, we think we've reduced it right down to 10, 20 uh, at the end of that day and hopefully down to zero. Uh, a week later so you just bear me i'll move this out the way i do apologize again but yeah but but it's not though but it sounds like it's raining <laughs> whoa most of them are dead yeah yeah but they're just flying around. Oh. <laughs> when it, oh, get off your body, <laughs> Jesus <laughs> God. Oh. Yeah. Well, there we go. Um, so I'll stop sharing that, Mark. <laughs> I think. Okay. There we go. So consequences are there's a bit of a mess to clean up, I think, uh, tomorrow. Uh, myself and Chris are going up there. If anybody wants to volunteer, please do. We've got to adhere to COVID rules as well, so it's a limited number. We're going to do the best that we can. Um, see how we get on, I think. Uh, hopefully uh, we'll have some success. The initial idea was to go in and pick all that broken glass up and clean up the room, but we didn't expect to see all that. And what it says, it, it, it shows the point that because we're on lockdown, because we're not meeting up, it doesn't mean council stop. The committee that runs the society on your behalf, it just carries on through all these. And these are the things that we deal with uh, behind the scenes. And most of the things are fun, some of them are not, but this is the job that we do, isn't it? Thanks very much, Mark, and I'll hand back over to you. Okay. Fun. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for uh, braving that room. Yeah. You can only laugh, can't you? you can't. <laughs> right. Uh, so the next announcement uh, is just a, a little congratulations to somebody. Uh, popular astronomer Mark Thompson, who some of you may recognise from his bits and pieces in various media. Uh, this week, he's been attempting to set a new Guinness World Record for the world's longest marathon lecture. And his attempt, he uh, had to beat a time of 139 hours, 42 minutes and 56 seconds, which is about five and a half days. So uh, he's been doing his lecture on astronomy and science all week and this morning he beat the record making it to 140 hours and in the process raised over eleven thousand pound for children's charity bernardo's so congratulations mark right that's all my announcements um before i carry on does anybody else have any announcements that they'd like to make to the society uh, just one quick one please mark um yeah usually this time of the year we do northwest astro fest um it used to be at Runcorn. We then decided to go over to a Warrington, nice venue. Um, unfortunately, due to lockdown, we couldn't do that. And we've been doing them virtual for the last year or so. So this year, we're going to be doing Northwest Astro Fest virtual on the 25th of September at 4 p.m. 
uh, in between 4 p.m. and 10 p.m. We've got four main speakers on for the day. Uh, that's Steve Warbus talking about astronomy in urban skies. Basically, despite the light pollution, you can actually get in, if, you know, images of constellations and so on. Um, later, we'll have uh, Ian Morrison from Jodrell Bank doing an advanced imaging, so a little bit more upmarket with the more uh, advanced equipment. Uh, following that into the afternoon, we have Martin Lunn talking about Thomas Cook and the telescopes. And for those who've been in the society a long time, you, you will recall that the society had set up at the museum of William Brown Street, uh, the five inch Cook refractor, amazing telescope, amazing images. Uh, so the history of Thomas Cook. To end the evening uh, at around nine o'clock, we've got Andy Briggs. Um, who'll be talking about gravitational waves. Uh, LIGO and so on. We've got to get the titles finalised, but uh, we're, we're on the way there. So if you just bear that in mind, we'll be uh, promoting that hopefully uh, via the social media and hopefully with uh, emails out to yourselves. And that's Saturday, the 25th of September, approximately 4pm onwards to 10pm. Thanks, Mark. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Last chance before we move on. Okay. I know we've got a couple of questions in the chat about Pex Hill and possibilities of returning and stuff um we'll if you want to chat about that in the chat box you can do or we can speak about it after the meeting uh, if that's okay because uh we're getting on for time it's almost half past seven okay so uh item six of the agenda uh this month our guest speaker is mr sam walton of the space plasma physics group in the department of space and climate physics in the mullard space science laboratory at university college london sam is joining us from the province of alberta in western canada where he's on placement as part of his phd which relates to the outer van allen radiation belt and its role in what is known as space weather and we might think of space weather as being something remote given that its name implies it's limited to space, but it can have very real effects on the Earth, whether it's the much loved aurora in the high atmosphere, increased radiation dosages for air travelers, or ground level effects such as the Carrington event of 1859, which caused telegraph machines to shock their operators and overhead wires to catch fire. Some of us may remember the wonderful aurora we witnessed in March 1989, but the same geomagnetic storm caused the power grid of Quebec to fail. Sam's talk will guide us through the origins and journey of the solar wind from the sun to the earth, describing some of these complex interactions and why they are so threatening to our existing infrastructure. Finally, what are scientists doing in order to ultimately understand, predict and mitigate the effects of space weather? So if you would all like to give a nice virtual applause, you can put your mics on briefly to clap if you like. <laughs> <laughs> to Sam, I will hand over to him. Uh, Thank you very much, Mark. <laughs> You've given half of my talk from there. Um, yeah, so thanks, everybody. Thanks for inviting me along. Um, it's been a while since I've done one of these talks, so it's nice to nice to get back out again. Uh, as Mark says, yeah, I'm, I'm currently in Canada on a placement, so it's it's lunchtime here, so it's not quite as... I won't be having a beer with you after because I've got work this afternoon. But, um, I uh, yeah, so I'm normally normally based at UCL, um, Doing a PhD in space plasmas, and I'm and today, as Mark said, I'm talking about space weather. So all about how how the sun interacts with the Earth, and then what effects that has on 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 us, basically. Uh, to summarise it, so and just in case anyone's worried about the level of this, I, I've given talks to to kids. I've given talks to people who are probably know more than me. So um, I, I do try and keep it as low as possible and build it up so that there's no prior understanding required. Um, so hopefully you all understand it, but obviously I'll, I'm happy to take questions at the end. Uh, so space weather, we need to understand, first of all, the space plasmas and how space, how plasma interacts with, uh, with, magnetic, with magnetic fields, basically, because there's lots of both in space. So we're gonna start off with um, how plasma behaves, how magnetic fields, behave and then how plasma behaves in inside a magnetic field or something like that anyway. Um, so we'll start off with a um, very basic uh, diagram of uh, matter. So matter being, you know, anything of substance that, so this is, this is uh, a diagram of a solid, I'm not sharing screen, am I? Um, <laughs> there we go. That might make things that, so 
that might make a bit more sense. Yeah, so this <laughs> this was my opening slide when I was doing all that talking. Sorry about that. Um, so this is the first slide. So this is a diagram of a solid state of matter. So as you as you probably understand quite well, a solid is all particles locked together um, in a very arranged kind of shape, which is why it holds its shape um, when you sit on a chair, for example, or something like that. If you add energy to a solid, um, you get a loosening off of those bonds that are holding the particles together, allows the particles to move around each other, uh, and they can take different shapes like a container. So that's your second solid, your second state of matter, which is a liquid. And then finally, from, from what we commonly see, um, the matter that we commonly see would be a gas, which is where you give it enough energy. So it gives water, for example, enough energy, and um, it starts to evaporate and become a gas because all those bonds completely break. And now you've got a load of individual particles um, that have got quite a bit of energy and are able to bounce around and bounce off each other and so on. Um, but we're talking about plasmas, which is a much higher energy than, than a gas. So if you think about the structure of an atom, so each one of those blue spheres that I had earlier um, represents an atom which contains a nucleus um, made up of neutrons and protons. Now, it's important to remember that neutrons have no electric charge. Protons have a positive electric charge, and then the electrons that orbit around the outside of an atom have a have a negative electric charge. Um, so if we give, so this is this is what this is our kind of simplified version of our atom now. Um, if we give an atom enough energy, uh, oh, this is our gas again. So if if we give our, our atom enough energy, the bond that holds the electron around the atom uh, can actually be broken off as well. And that means that you're left with um, a positively charged nucleus without an electron. And we're going to call this an ion from now on. So whenever I say ion, I simply mean a, a positively charged particle. Um, and then we're left with a free electron. So an electron on its own that's not attached to an atom. And so a plasma looks more like this. I hope this is coming through on the connection well enough. But this is what a plasma tends to look like. Um, ions and electrons bouncing around very, very energetic. So we're talking about obviously the levels of energy that you would find um, inside the sun, for example. Um, so moving on to magnetic fields now, um, this is a representation of a magnetic field in, uh, well, in space anywhere really, um, where the, the lines represent magnetic field lines. So the, the direction of the, of the field. And it's, we need to understand how um, part, these particles behave inside magnetic fields because that happens a lot in space. Um, so if we look at it head on and we throw a ion, an ion uh, into a magnetic field or an electron, we get some electromagnetic forces, fundamental electromagnetic forces which act on these particles. And what it does is it means that just because there's a bit of maths here, I'll not go through it because I understand that can get quite boring, but the, from the laws of electromagnetism, we know that if a particle is moving across a magnetic field, we get a force called the Lorentz force, which moves that particle in a, in a circular direction. So any charged, par charged particles, by the way, is what I mean. So an ion, which is positively charged, an electron, which is negatively charged, the, charge, uh, the negatively charged particles go in a different direction. Um, so let's look at this head on. So they don't, they don't just move, um, in a circle. You can, they can also move along the magnetic field line. So if we, uh, throw some particles out of here uh, through this magnetic field at an angle, we still get the force, which makes them move in a circular motion, but there's nothing stopping the particle moving along the field. And this is a really important, um, aspect of space plasma physics, because it means that, um, if you take a plasma like this, like we had earlier, and then apply a magnetic field to it, all the particles all of a sudden become what the phrase we use is called frozen into the field. So particles, because they're stuck in this circular motion, energetic charged particles stuck in the circular motion, they can't move across the field, only along the direction of the magnetic field. Um, which means uh, that if you have a really energetic plasma in a magnetic field and the plasma moves, it will move and distort the field with it and vice versa. So if you move a field that's that's frozen to a plasma, it will move and the plasma will distort with it. So this is a really fundamentally important part of um, 
of space plasma physics because it, it dictates a lot of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, and just a, a nice little factoid, I guess, 99% uh, of all ordinary matter in the universe is in fact a plasma. Um, don't ask me about antimatter or dark matter because that's not my uh, field of expertise, but ordinary matter, 99% of it is, is plasma and the other 1% is solids, liquids, gases, um, and other rare states of matter as well. Um, so this brings us to the sun, which is where we start off, oops, which is where we start off our, our journey to, uh, in space weather. So the sun is a big giant ball of plasma in space and it, it gets its energy from constant nuclear fusion reaction of uh, hydrogen atoms into helium. And just, just as we uh, get from a nuclear weapon, this, this releases a huge amount of energy um, and the kind of um, trade-off between gravity and this huge amount of energy keeps the sun in a nice spherical shape. Um, <clears throat> and this, this picture is taken from, um, I think it's Stereo A, or a spacecraft orbiting the sun um, in, a, in a particular wavelength. And immediately when we look at a close-up picture of the sun like this, we can see that there's, there's more going on than just a bright, hot ball of plasma. There's lots of different features. So doubt. can you see my cursor, by the way, um, here? Yeah. Cool. OK, that's good. I can point to things. So around here, this, uh, this brighter spot on the sun, a more active region, there's darker regions, there's tiny little features everywhere. There's also plumes of, of plasma coming out of the sun around the edge, which you can see. Um, the sun is a very complex, um, complex thing to study. Um, and one of the ways we can kind of study that is by imaging the sun in different wavelengths. So this is more of a, a UV, um, uh, UV? Yeah, this is about a UV wavelength. I can't remember the exact wavelength it's imaged in. But if we move slightly across, so go to a slightly higher frequency, uh, smaller wavelength, and look, look at an X-ray image of the sun, this is exactly the same image, uh, but taken at a different wavelength. Um, it reveals, reveals different features of the sun now. So where we saw the active regions before, we're now seeing lots of magnet, lots of sort of loops of plasma here. Um, and where we saw the plumes of plasma before um, on the edge here, we can now see, we can really clearly see the plasma coming out. And this is a great example of the frozen in theorem that we talked about earlier, where the plasma is actually frozen to the sun's magnetic field there. So we can use the plasma to see the, the sun's magnet, magnetic field and what's going on. Um, and yeah, the sun can be imaged in lots of different ways and we can learn a lot simply by taking different kinds of pictures of it. So we can see things about how, how magnetic the sun is at particular locations. Um, this one up here is actually the visible light. So what we would see with our own eyes if we add like a, a light filter on it um, to look at sunspots and so on. Um, various different features of, of the the sun's atmosphere that we can see in the different wavelengths as well. Um, now, I'm not a solar physicist, I'm a plasma physicist, so I can't talk too much about that, but that's a basic overview of, of the sun. Um, and so the, the, the thing about the sun, which, which has a big effect on space weather, is that it's very variable in its activity. It changes over, over time. So this is the sun on the 4th of June, 2013. Um, and the next one is, 1st of September 2012 and I'll just flip back and forward again and you can see the, the dramatic difference in the how active the sun is from 2013 to 2012. Um, if we move to 2020 um, you can see the activity has dropped quite a lot and that's just in, in the space of about seven years. Um, I, I can't, if you go on Helio Viewer, just google Helio Viewer, you can actually get a almost live live stream of the sun in this in these different wavelengths you can see i think they update it every five minutes so uh, that's a really useful thing to just well not useful but a fun thing to play about with um so the, yeah this is the fourth of november so what this is a is a demonstration of is is the sun's reg, very regular variability um hold on yeah the very regular variability of the sun so this is what we call the solar cycle and it's well established so the sun goes through activity cycles where it goes from a low activity up to high activity back down to low. This is an example of solar cycle 23. 
Um, so we're currently in Silver Cycle 25. Um, Silver Cycle 23 began in 1996. As you can see, uh, activity is very low. Right up to 2001, uh, very, very active, back down to 2006, which is not very active at all. And then, it, then the cycle restarts again. And these cycles have been recorded over, um, how do I get rid of this? Um, never mind. Uh, these cycles have been recorded over a long, long period of time. So as you can see, this, this diagram, this uh, chart up here is, is from the year 1870 all the way to 2000, about, about 16, 2017, uh, needs updating for 2020. But um, this shows the sim quite simply the, the activity or the, the sunspot area on the sun, which corresponds to activity. So every approximately 11 years, um, we get this increased and decrease, increased and decrease of activity. Uh, and what's also interesting is that there's kind of a cycle going on over the top as well. So down in the 1880s, the peaks of these uh, cycles were comparatively low and then increasing right up to the 1950s and 60s when we have a, a huge solar maximums um, and then dropping down again. We're in quite a low period of solar activity at the minute. Um, and as I said, I kind of already mentioned it, but the, the sunspots on the sun, so these are two images taken at the same time. The sunspots on the sun kind of kind of correspond to the activity. So if, if we do identify a cluster of sunspots, we can start to be worried about what might come out, like you know, the activity that might come out of those sunspots. Um, and one final uh, kind of plot, uh, you can see the one we had earlier on the top, which is the sunspot activity. So the number of sunspots essentially, or the area of sunspots on the sun. This on the bottom is slightly different. So it's along the same, length of time but what it's showing is so down the middle here is the equator of the sun and then at the top of this is the north pole of the sun bottom of the, is the south pole of the sun and what this is showing is the position of those sunspots that we're seeing so what's interesting is that at the start of every solar cycle the sunspots tend to appear a bit closer a bit higher and lower closer to the poles and as the cycle goes on um we uh, the sunspots tend to appear closer to the equator and then as the cycle restarts again they appear near the poles again which is is really interesting <laughs> mainly because uh, it, it, it helps us understand kind of the internal di dynamics of what's going on in the sun but the problem is it's really hard to actually observe what's going on inside the sun so we don't really know too much about about this at the minute um so moving on again so this the sun is is not just a, a ball of plasma in space things you know, it, it emits a, a huge amount of material all the time so if anyone's ever seen a solar a total solar eclipse uh, look at you um this is a picture of a total solar eclipse where there's this, the moon is acting essentially as a block for the light that comes from the sun so that we can then really clearly see um the material that that surrounding the sun um and this is this is plasma being emitted from the sun all the time uh constantly so we call this the solar wind um it's yeah constant stream of plasma um and it makes up the the sort of immediate surrounding areas of the sun or what uh well the sun's atmosphere but we refer to it as the sun's corona so the solar corona um so this is what you can see here you can make out the sun's magnetic field quite nicely from this one being because the plasma is freezing to the magnetic field um as we as we mentioned um you can identify this the, the polar regions of the sun just from these really clearly defined streaks of plasma here following the magnetic field uh, and then you can see the sort of kind of make out the equatorial regions of the sun as well um there and then here as well slightly not quite in line but really clearly see that now, the solar corona is a huge problem in itself because um, it's really, really hot, which is not probably not surprising. But the sun's surface is only about 6,000 degrees centigrade, um, while the solar corona is, can get to temperatures of up to about 15 million degrees centigrade, which um, 
so the big question is is where on earth does well what where on earth where on the sun does that does all that energy come from to heat up the uh, the solar corona um and yeah th this this really is one of the biggest biggest questions in space plasma physics right now we are really are nowhere near understanding where all that energy comes from um so i've got a nice little clip hopefully that's coming out nicely on your screens um but this is a, a video of the solar wind um leaving the sun it travels at around about 450 kilometers per second which is by my calculations about a million miles per hour um and it's yeah this is what we generally refer to as the solar wind so average speed about 450 kilometers per second every now and again you get a big burst of activity like you might be able to see one or two going on here so this is the solar wind and then you get a, a burst there a burst here um and th this is an example of a huge huge burst uh in 2012 um this is called a coronal mass ejection you, you might have also heard of the term solar flares or or solar storms uh that kind of thing they, they're all categorized in certain ways but generally the largest type of those um storms is a coronal mass ejection literally an ejection of mass from the solar corona and this is observed from uh, one of the sdo spacecraft i think and or stereo spacecraft that's in space um again using kind of using the same thing as the as the moon did using a little thing in the middle to block out the light from the sun meaning that you can easily observe what's coming out of it um, and this kind of snowflakey effect that you see here is this big burst of plasma the coronal mass ejection going past the spacecraft because it's made up of charged particles ions and electrons it's really interfering with the electronics on the on the spacecraft so it's showing up in the video um and these things are a lot faster than the solar wind so these are more like three thousand kilometers per second uh, about six and a half million miles per hour something something like that um and these are the things that we've got to worry about so again they're, they're much denser um than than the normal solar wind they travel much faster uh, this is in fact this is a bit, this one that i'm showing you here is a coronal mass ejection that happened in 2012. now I don't know if you've heard about the Carrington event, but that is a very famous uh, corona mass ejection or, or event, solar star at the time, we didn't know exactly what it was, but very famous event that was observed in the 1800s um, of a, basically one of the largest um, corona mass ejections on record, um, which was headed directly towards Earth. Now this one, this is a simulation of the one in 2012 that I was talking about, which was of comparable size to the Carrington event. And if you look at, so you get little bursts here, the Earth's over here. This is looking at a top-down view of the solar system with the sun in the middle. This huge burst that is, there we go, that huge one there is the 2012 coronal mass ejection. Had that have hit, hit Earth, the consequences would have been um, huge. So we're, we're talking, I mean, you'll find out why in a little bit, but we're talking trillions and trillions and trillions in in economic damage um from a something like that and we'll talk about why later what's also just a little interesting thing about the sun is because the sun's rotating um kind of like the earth does when it spits out these these bursts of plasma it kind of forms a spiral um as it's going out into the solar system uh, so you get these kind of spiral shapes going out this is called a parker spiral um named after a famous solar physicist um and just an illustration of how huge these corona mass ejections can be this is the sun oh, i don't know which cme this is but this is just a video uh, again taken from one of the stereo spacecraft of a corona mass ejection that happened come, came from the sun so this here is a sunspot or a cluster of sunspots um and ejects millions of tons of of solar material so plasma out into space most of it goes back into space out into space some of it falls back down to the ground um, but the earth is probably around about the size of my cursor here so you can see how how, how large these things are um, and this is a really nice little uh, simulation as well of so the sun is this black dot here the white lines are the sun's magnetic field 
And as we know, the plasma follows and, tr and is kind of frozen to the magnetic field. So as the coronal mass ejection gets thrown out into space, it distorts the field, it expands with the field as it goes out into space, and it becomes a, a huge, huge thing um, that propagates out into the solar system. After about three days, well, in this case, 68 hours, it gets to around about where you would find Earth, which is a, basically not even a grain of sand compared to the size of this coronal mass ejection. So this is, these are the instances that we, got, that, we, that we worry about when we talk about space weather and the threats of space weather. Um, so now moving on to the kind of the interaction of the solar wind with Earth. So the Earth has its own magnetic field. You might have seen something like this, where a North Pole and a South Pole on a magnet. You have a magnetic field that flows from North to South. Earth is kind of like that, apart from the magnetic field flows the other way. So every, every number of years, few thousand years, the Earth pole, the magnetic poles of the Earth kind of like to flip over. We really don't know why, but they do. We happen to be in a time right now where magnetic north is actually at our geographic south and magnetic south is actually at our geographic north. So our magnetic field flows from south geographic south to geographic north. So we have kind of an upside down magnetic field at the minute. Um, and what this means is that because you're talking about separate magnetic fields, we know that plasma likes to freeze to its own magnetic field, to, to the magnetic field it's on. So when this corona mass ejection hits the Earth, um, our magnetic field kind of uh, behaves as like a shield. So as you can see here, all this plasma from the sun gets deflected around the Earth um, and formed, you'll see it really clearly in a minute, and, and forms uh, a cavity, kind of a bullet-shaped cavity in space, which is essentially the solar wind being uh, deflected around our magnetic field. Um, and there it is, there's our magnetic field. Uh, and this area of space that is influenced by the Earth's magnetic field, we call the, the Earth's magnetosphere, um, like atmosphere or kind of thing. We call it the Earth's magnetosphere, the area of space influenced. And from a side view, so the sun is to the left now, sun is to the left. Um, from a side view, it looks kind of like this. So because the solar wind is, we have a constant stream of solar wind in general, so the front side of the Earth's magnetic field is quite compressed, as you can see. And then the day side, the, sorry, that's that's the day side. And then the night side, to, so the sun is to the left, which is why it's the day side, night side to the right. The night side gets stretched out and compressed in the middle down here uh, as the solar wind gets, gets uh, deflected around it, basically. Uh, and this means that the magnetic field is set up to do some really, really complicated things when we get a heightened period of solar wind, such as a solar flare or a coronal mass ejection and so on, because we've got some really high pressure points here, right at the right on the nose. Um, and then we've also got some very high magnetic pressure along this line inside the, um, the night side as well, then what we call the magneto tail. Um, so what that means is, yeah, when we get a big impact from the sun, it can kind of break open the Earth's magnetic field which me uh, and attach to the suns, which means that some of the plasma from the sun can then stream down along that connected field into the Earth's mag magnetic field. And then right at the back, when the these lines it get, then those open lines get dragged around. I'll play it again because I, I couldn't explain that quick enough. Um, when they disconnect and attach to the sun, they get dragged around to the back of the, of the magnet magnetosphere plasma streams in and then when on this night side here when the lines reconnect again when the field reconnects again a lot of that plasma that's been dragged around into the into the tail gets forced then close to the earth um, and this is kind of the next step so solar wind has hit the earth when we get a big instance like a corona mass ejection that hits the earth the disturbance that that causes in the in the magnetic field, as you've just seen, is what we refer to as a geomagnetic storm or or a substorm, depending on who you ask. Storms tend to last a few days to weeks. Substorms tend to last a few hours. Um, but all in all, it's a it's a we'll call it a storm for now, just because it's it, to represent a heightened period of activity. 
And now then, because these field lines are now closed again, the magnetic field's closed and there's plasma being entered there, that means that plasma gets trapped in the magnetic field. And, and the, the particles that are spinning around the magnetic field lines and moving along, moving back and forth, up and down these field lines, basically stay there um, and become trapped. And they build up to such an extent that we, are, we do have very hot and very radioactive populations of plasma um, surrounding the Earth, very close to Earth. Um, here's another nice diagram. I couldn't find one that was pointing the other way, so we're kind of flipping our perspective now. The sun is to the right hand side, so the day side is day side is here where my cursor is. The sun is over there to the right hand side, and there you can see the magneto tail there. So these yellow lines at the top and bottom represent the open field lines that are still attached to the sun's magnetic field. This is where the plasma is streaming down. And then the ones that are shaded are the closed field lines where the plasma has then become trapped. Now, because of the constant, this happens quite regularly. So because we have constant in, um, injections of plasma, um, it gets quite packed. And it means that plasma becomes even more energized just because of the fact that there's lots, lots of it. So th this outer, this green outer um, kind of shell is what we call the plasma sheet. This is kind of the, the initial injection of plasma that we get from the solar wind. Um, ignore these temperatures here. This is massively over-exaggerated. So as I said, pl the plasma is really hot, but it's not. It's dense in space terms. Space is typically thought of as a vacuum, but it, surrounding Earth, much of space is not a vacuum because we have a, approximately one particle per per cubic centimetre. Um, the air on Earth, we have about eight, eight quadrillion or so particles. Some, I can't remember the exact number. Many, many particles per, per cubic centimetre. So it's not very dense um, on, for someone on Earth, but in space it is, it is very dense. Um, so the temperature kind of doesn't matter because um, that changes with the density. So that's the plasma sheet, um, the outer, outer shell. As these field lines keep pumping in plasma and keep compressing all this plasma um, in here, we get we get a secondary population which kind of behaves on its own, uh, which is called the the ring current. Uh, so this is this is a, a further energized bubble of plasma, kind of donut shaped donut shaped bubble of plasma around the Earth, which is frozen to those inner field lines, um, and this just keeps going so if you get further injections in a short space of time you get the final in my opinion the most interesting donut shaped bubble of plasma which is the van allen radiation belts which is this super energized um relative what we call relativistic um electrons that surround the earth and there's a few references on here so um this here is geostationary orbit uh, if i just go back um, the moon is out here, so just the sense of scale. So the moon's out, out here. It goes in and out of the uh, magnetosphere. This is kind of a typical observational satellite orbit. This is geostationary. This is about the ISS down here, this white thing here. So very much a concern for satellites surrounding the Earth. Um, so this is a kind of nice illustration of Van Al. So this is a real um, simulation of the Van Allen radiation belts based on real data that we've collected. What makes them really interesting is that um, they're highly, highly variable um, in intensity. So the colours here, so the more the more redder colours that you see, are the more intense, hotter electrons. The the cooler sort of greens, blue colours are the cooler electrons. So you can see that the intensity varies. This is over a few days, so the intensity varies quite a lot quite quickly, but also the spatial extent of the Van Allen belt. So it, there's lots of complex things going on in there, which, um, which dictate what, what the belts will look like. Um, specifically the outer belt, the inner one is much more stable because it's made of protons, but the electron belt, the outer belt is um, very, very variable. And it's, um, <clears throat> it's a balance between essentially those injection processes that you see that we show, we've talked about, and <clears throat> and the loss processes which cause the, some of these particles to be lost, um, and they become lost because 
one of the main reasons they become lost is because some of the particles kind of bounce so close to Earth that they hit the atmosphere um, and become lost to the atmosphere. So the atmosphere kind of inter it, the plasma uh, interacts with the atmosphere and it dissipates all their energy and they never make it back up to space. And this has a this actually is it's very significant um, as a loss process. So this is part of what balances out and makes them so variable. The Van Allen belts. Um, we'll come back to those later because they're they're an issue when it comes to satellites. But just the final step in our journey through space uh, with space weather uh, is the when these particles hit the Earth when they're of a particular energy. Um, I'm sure some of you know, some of you might not that this energizes particles in the atmosphere. So kind of like a neon light, where you get a stream of electrons hitting a gas. In this case, the atmosphere energizes electrons around atoms in the atmosphere and then that releases uh, particles of light and we see that from the surface as as the aurora so uh, this is the aurora kind of a, a, a diagram of the aurora from space and it appears as like as an oval shape and what this is is basically how the the footprint of the magnetic field lines um on the earth so they come out of the earth from the poles the auroral oval is the footprint of those of the magnetic field uh, so yeah, which is why you can see the aurora in in places like northern Canada. I haven't seen it yet since I've got here, but I'm determined to. Um, and you can also see it in like, you know, the Scandinavian countries, northern northern Europe, uh, Iceland, kind of thing. Um, we call the northern so that we get this at the north and the south pole. So we call the northern aurora aurora borealis and the southern aurora. Um, or the Southern Lights, uh, Aurora Australis. Yeah, you might you might have also referred to the, heard the Aurora mentioned as, as the Northern Lights or the Southern Lights as well. Um, and the Aurora varies a lot. So if you've ever seen the Aurora, it uh, it varies a huge amount as well. I, I just you can actually see it with your own eyes, um, dancing around and moving, taking different shapes. And that's because of the that's a measure of the geomag geomagnetic activity that's going on. So this is the um, the Aurora during a uh, a substorm, geomagnetic substorm, and you can see. So this is kind of the quiet aurora, as we would call it. And then you can see very obviously when the when the substorm hits, you get a huge flare up of the aurora, pulses running through, and that's why you get all the different moving patterns and shapes uh, as you go along. Um, another thing about the aurora is that when you get a storm or a substorm, uh, a geomagnetic storm or substorm not only does the aurora vary in intensity so how bright it is and how active it is but also it get the auroral oval gets wider and wider as well so this this is the southern aurora now and you can see as each of these images goes along the aurora gets brighter and it also gets much wider so when you have a heightened period of activity you can see you can see the aurora further closer to the equator as well so if you've ever seen the aurora in Scotland or Northern England, for example, you're probably talking about a significant amount of geomagnetic activity going on in space. Um, one, yeah. So, oh, I'll talk. I'll talk about that later. I'm going to talk about the Canada 1989 thing. But the the aurora when when that um, when that storm hit in 1989, the aurora was seen as low down as as people, places like Texas and Florida. Um, and as north as, as Southeast Asia as well. So, so people were wondering what the hell, what on earth was going on, basically. Um, and especially at a time, you know, Southern USA during the Cold War, there was a lot of, lot of alarm bells ringing, let's say. Um, where are we now? There we go. So this is the Aurora from the International Space Station. Um, there's probably a, a short exposure time on this, but it really is that clear sometimes um, with the colors, you know, the, the green color just happens to be um, the wavelength of light that oxygen emits. You can also get red colors, which you can see slightly here. You can also get, you can even get blues and purples as well. Um, and this is from the ground. This is a, this is a long exposure shot. Um, I'm not sure how, how edited this is, but this is, this is from Iceland. Um, and you can see the blue aurora there um, on top of this green aurora, Com most commonly green aurora, just because that's that's the wavelength that our atmosphere emits most of the time. So in terms of the actual space weather, we've kind of made it to the to the end. 
um, I'm now going to talk about what effects this has on um, on on us, basically, what what technological impacts it has. And I, I always stress to people that you might have heard many people talk about doomsday scenarios and say this could happen, this that could happen. With space weather, it does happen, and we've recorded it happen many many times of the damages that it can do, and it and um, it is only a matter of time really until until a very serious effects can we can have a very serious effect on on society but just to go through some of these so one of the big the big problems with with a uh, geomagnetic activity and space weather is that it can uh generate electric currents flowing through the atmosphere quite a low portion of the atmosphere so i don't know if any of you have ever had an electric toothbrush uh, but the charging base for the electric toothbrush does a sim very similar thing. So you don't actually plug your toothbrush in, you actually just pop it on a base, really. Um, and that's because um, the base is generating a magnetic field, um, which is generating an electric current due to laws of electromagnetism, which I'll not go into too much detail. But when you generate a magnetic field, it induces uh, an electric current. And that's what happens um, in our atmosphere so you get a disturbed magnetic field with heightened magnetic field strengths and everything moving about everywhere generates ionospheric currents so ionosphere being being part of the part of the atmosphere a layer of the atmosphere which is low enough so that if we do get these in currents induced these can overload power lines they can trip circuit breakers they can they can mess with all sorts of communications um and that I get, like we said, that that did happen in, in Canada, in the province of Quebec, um, in 1989, because it, it overloaded the power lines and tripped the, the circuit breakers. So it, it left, I think, about eight million people uh, out with no power for for about nine hours. And trust, you don't want to be without power on a on a cold uh, Canada winter night. <laughs> trust me. Um, so it's not just the inconvenience as well. Obviously, that that costs huge amount of money to, to repair you know talking millions millions in canadian dollars to repair um and this uh, in a more severe case so you know thinking about the carrington event this will have such widespread effects that you could knock out global power systems with with a with a strong geomagnetic storm such as the one from 2012 as well which which very nearly did hit as well i think we, had it been 10 days earlier we would have been right in the firing line, um, which is, you know, if we lo lost power globally, I mean, th that is not a cheap thing to, to repair. Um, well, so we are becoming not only since, since the Carrington event, we've come so much more, become so much more reliant. Like back, back in the 1800s, the only thing was really telephone lines that were affected. But right now we're becoming so much more reliant on these technologies that could be affected by space weather. Um, so GPS is one of those. Um, you've all used a sat nav to, you, you know, a lot of us rely on sat navs on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, GPS provides that. Um, aviation use GPS. Uh, even, you know, driverless trains are becoming more of a thing now. They use GPS to tell where to go on the platform. Uh, military operations, submarines, even farmers' vehicles are using um, GPS these days to, to, to for automated automated harvesting of crops. Um, driverless cars will be a thing at some point. So, and these these will all be if if space if a huge geomagnetic storm um, caused all this to be, to disappear within a space of a few hours. Um, we'd be in quite a lot of trouble because we're very reliant on these things. Uh, so another thing, not just on Earth, but up in space, we have many, many, many thousands of satellites uh, up in space that we rely on. So this is just a, this doesn't include space debris, which is even more scary. So as you can see, very close to the Earth, there's thousands and thousands of satellites operating very close to the Earth um, and in different orbits as well. You can see a really prominent ring around the Earth here, which is a uh, geosynchronous orbit or geostationary orbit. And for those that are not, not entirely sure what that is, that is um, an area of Earth orbit whereby the satellite orbits at the same speed at which the Earth rotates, if that makes sense. So 
the satellite is looking at the same point above the Earth um, all the time, which is a very useful orbit. It's also a very specific orbit, which means it gets very crowded. Um, this is used for things like uh, you know weather satellites, uh, observational satellites on the Earth, communications, TV, radio, you know, you name it, mobile phone signal. Lots of these uh, provide. Lots of that comes from satellites in geostationary orbit. A bit further down, you also get, um, yeah, all your GPS satellites. Um, anything, anything that uses connection over long distances is uses satellites in space. The significance of this is that geosynchronous orbit is right in one of the most unpredictable regions of the outer Van Allen radiation belt where all these high energy, high density electrons reside. So we can see at any given time, we could be completely outside of them, completely inside of them. We could be getting some weak radiation. We could be getting some really strong radiation. So these, these satellites are right where, and obviously most of the satellites in Earth orbit as well, are right down in, in the most intense, most, most unpredictable areas of the radiation belts. Um, yeah, and this is an example, I think as of the last time I checked, which was probably about a year ago, there was about 550 uh, satellites in geostationary orbit. Um, and yeah, that includes, like I said, commercial, uh, military, uh, government satellites, so all kinds of different things that we probably don't even know. A lot of people probably don't even know that we're reliant on. Um, some of the more obvious effects that the radiation belts can have on these satellites is, is physical damage. So because of the high, really high energy, really hot electrons that are there, you can cause some serious damage to some solar arrays. So this is just from a test that was done. Um, this is another, some electronics panel, um, just simply firing some energetic electrons at a satellite so they are quite vulnerable and there are many satellites in the past that have actually been taken down completely from from a highly active van allen belt um some of them have kind of been shut down for a bit and then uh and then restarted again eventually after because the again not forgetting that we're talking about electrically charged particles as well. So this can completely throw off electronics and, and signal communications with the satellites. Um, so very, very vulnerable. Um, so not quite there yet. Uh, so what we want to basically do as scientists is understand these things that go on in the radiation belts uh, to the point that to the point of predictability. So we want to understand them so much that we can take an observation further upstream. So from the sun, for example, and say, right, on this day at this time, we're going to um, experience this amount of radiation. Um, you know, this is how now how we're going to deal with this. Um, and very often it can be solved by simply turning off the satellite, switching off all the electronics um, for a certain amount of time let the particles pass again you're still risking physical damage but in terms of the electronics and the communications switch off and switch back on again or even pointing in a different direction often works because of how the electrons travel down the field we can kind of tell which sometimes tell which uh, direction they're coming from as well which is kind of kind of more what i'm looking at as well um so just a tiny snippet of re this is some of my research from quite a while ago now um but just kind of an idea of, of how we look at these things. So I'm using a, a one of NASA's satellites to look at how, so based on the, on the theory that if we can observe one part of the radiation belts, can we then use that information to predict what's going to happen in another part of the radiation belt? So what we've got here is along the bottom, we've got time. So this is for the whole year of 1998. Um, and up on the side, so what was what these lines are showing is, um, to put it simply, the intensity of electrons, and each each one of these lines uh, is a different location in the radiation belt. So what this is what the L of four, L of five, L of six means. That's just a coordinate system referring to three different locations. And what you can see is there's an overall trend that when you get an increase or in or an enhancement in the intensity all three of these locations you get an enhancement so and then you can see these all over here 
when you get a big dropout of of electrons you can see the gradual dropout in all of these locations um I've, yeah but then there's a handful of places for example where uh, so at this location <clears throat> the blue line location four um you get a quite you get a drop whereas the other two locations you get an increase uh, in the electron intensity same here um doing slightly different things and then same here where you, you kind of got an overall trend of decrease but this green line is is a bit all over the place so you're getting drops you're getting increases all in there so it, it's no real surprise but it's very obvious that there's um there's lots of different things going on as well as some overall underlying effects as well so the illustration of how complicated it is to understand van allen radiation belts um so for the final sort of bit i'll stop banging on about my particular area of expertise ultimately to understand what's going on in the radiation belts which is complex in itself and what's going on on earth we have to understand what's going on right back at the sun if we can't predict the sun then there's only so you know we've only got so much notice if we can understand what the sun's going to do that kind of gives us a head start so to to help us then understand what's going to happen when this corona mass ejection for example what's going to happen when that hits the magnetosphere so recently well i say recently god the time Sam, yeah could i just check with you um we're at quarter past eight and uh, would you like to have the break now, or would you prefer to finish first and then? I've probably have got the break. About, probably got about five minutes left. Okay, so. let's carry on then, and then uh, I'll yeah. pass back over to you. Okay, thanks. So uh, we have to understand what's going on at the sun. So this is a mission that you might have seen from uh, God. 2019 now until February 2020. So it's called Solar Orbiter. This is a, just a an artist illustration of Solar Orbiter, the spacecraft. Um, it's going to be, it, it's on its way to the sun right now. It got launched, God, I can't remember the date. I'm sure it was last February last year. Um, and the idea is that the Solar Orbiter is going to get as close to the sun as we've ever been before. It's going to get 40 million kilometers from the surface, which is about five times closer than, than Mercury. Um, you may have also heard of Parker Solar Probe and so on. Um, and th this is the orbit. I'm not going into detail on this, but essentially to get there, we have to launch the spacecraft and use a series of planetary passes to, to throw the spacecraft into the sun. Um, because, of course, we're not actually... You know, what's happening is the Earth traveling around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour what we have to do is slow the spacecraft down so that it kind of falls towards the sun. Um, and a quick overview of what's on solar orbiter. So this giving you an idea now of kind of how we observe these things. So um, the electron, we have a, a bunch of instruments which measure things like the temperature of the solar wind, um, the, the density, the, the speed, the, all, all these different properties about what's in the electrons and the, the ions in the solar wind. So we're talking things like electron analyzers, heavy ions, um, proton sensors, and then of course a, a processing unit which sends all that data back to Earth. Um, I'm going to focus in on this instrument just for a, a couple of minutes, which is the electron analyzer system, because it was built at Mullard Space Science Laboratory. <laughs> um, and this is the instrument itself. These cylinders here, essentially, when an electron hits one of these cylinders, tells the detector all about that particular electron. These two people are the two, the two principal, the PIs, the, you know, the bosses of the instrument. On the right, Professor Chris Owen. On the left, Professor Louise Hara. Um, you may or may not have heard of them. Um, and it's about those two silver handles on the side. You would, you would hold the instrument sort of like that. So it's, it's quite sizable. It's about, si yeah, quite sizable. You uh, pick it up with two hands. Um, and this is the Solar Orbiter spacecraft uh, with the solar panels all folded up. So about the size of a small car, it weighs a few, few tons. Um, and this is the shield which protects it from the sun's directly from the sun's radiation. So, uh, which is made out of ground up cow bones. Um, so, uh, apparently that turns out to be a effective barrier to, uh, solar radiation. So solar orbit isn't vegan, unfortunately, but, um, 
it was the most cost effective method. Uh, this was the launch, there we go, Feb 10th of February 2020. That's launched from uh, Cape Canaveral in Florida. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't one of the many people <laughs> that got to go and watch it. Um, but I know lots of people that did. Um, and obviously, when 15, 20 years of work has gone into this, it's a huge moment for a place like um, MSSL. So final bit. Um, well, my last three slides. Uh, this is Mullard Space Science Laboratory, where I work, uh, not right now, but where I... Uh, where I'm doing my PhD and I'll be returning to in January. We're based in the middle of the Surrey Hills. Uh, we're just essentially a, an old stately home converted into offices. It's an amazing place to, to do your work day to day, even if I haven't been since last March, since lockdown. Um, this is a picture on a nice summer's day. Uh, my office is right here where my cursor is. It's just in one of those windows there. Um, but we do everything from the research so we we build instruments so this big thing here is where we build a lot of instruments so we built that instrument that's currently in space now we've got instruments on mars we've got instruments all over the solar system that were built at mssl uh, and then we also have operations team which take the data and we also have scientists and students like myself who then analyze that data um, to to do the research so oh and this is just an example of all of the missions that all of the, the launchers that, that have carried MSSL built instruments, all, all UK built instruments, um, and Solar Orbiter is yet to be added onto that. Next year, the Mars 2020, which should have been 2020, but now 20, well, 2023 actually, it's going to launch. So soon we'll have another instrument on Mars in the next few years as well. Um, and finally, what? so given all this information, what are we um, doing with it? Um, well, we do actually have if you, the Met Office does have a desk here called um, nicely named MOSWOC, which stands for Met Office Space Weather Operations Center. Um, and essentially it gives us instead of a weather forecast, they give us a space weather forecast. You can go if you Google Met Office Space Weather, it takes you to their page. You can get um, things like auroral forecasts, space weather forecasts. Um, it's very easy to get an auroral forecast. So if you're ever in a place where you could see the aurora, you can get auroral forecasts that will tell you what the aurora is going to be like in the next few hours. Uh, and you can see this guy is looking at, um, he's looking at the surface of the sun in, in all sorts of different wavelengths. He's looking at all these different parameters we've talked about, like the speed of the solar wind, the density, looking for any signs of any activity. And what, what will happen basically is if, if something comes up as a possible threat, he'll quantify that threat threat he'll send a message out he'll send an alert out to all the companies that have satellites at risk and he'll say essentially this is the this is the risk you do what you want with this information and then they decide whether to um whether to switch off do nothing you know at their own risk um and right now it's not particularly we can get accurate predictions probably a couple of days in advance um to, to the the satellites again you can ask me more about that after because i know i know time's getting on now so um yeah and this is an example of one of those forecasts so aurora forecasts almost like a weather report so <laughs> this was back in november i should have got a new one for today to be honest but um so you know it can tell you what solar activity is like geomagnetic activity radiation uh so th what's this this is a 24-hour forecast and this one down here is a um where are we so four-day forecast um, so something you can go and do after if you wanted to do. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's my that's the end of my talk. Um, I hope I hope you've learned a lot from it, and I and I'm yeah happy to happy to take questions now. I suppose we'll go for a break first if people if that's what's going to happen. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. That was really good. Um, so yeah, we'll have a quick break and then we'll come back to do questions and answers. So everybody, have a think if the, if you've got any questions that you want to ask. Uh, if there's anything you need clarified or you've got, I don't know, have a think. <laughs> it's over to you. Uh, we'll come back at, uh, is half eight okay for everybody? Is that long enough? Or do you need five five more minutes. minutes. Do you want 10 minutes? Should we say 10 minutes? So yeah. uh, eight 8.35 
if you'd be back for 8.35 and then we'll go straight on to the questions. Okay, and while we're in the break, if I could just remind everybody, you're more than welcome to talk amongst yourselves, put your microphones on, videos on, etc. But do bear in mind, you are still being recorded and you are still going out to the public on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Twice. so uh yeah, yeah. Fa a fascinating subject isn't it um i, I mean I, I remember the 89 myself and paul were just uh chatting there before um 1989 and i remember waking you up mark at 11 o'clock in the evening uh, you were fast asleep and I, I just dragged you out of bed if i remember it was your yeah, birthday. That was an amazing Aurora. Yeah. It was, it was your, just me. Incredible. Yeah. Ninth birthday. Like yeah. a big umbrella across the whole oh, sky. Little yeah. I distinctly nice remember. Years. I remember seeing Leo oh, almost uh, due, you know, at its highest. And the, the uh, auroral corona, I suppose that's the best way. Of this, uh, or, or auroral crown, I think is the term. It was just there embedded in the sickle of Leo and everything emanated from there, but it, it pulsed and there was reds and there was greens and it was just mesmerizing. And it was just absolutely unbelievable. And it was quite, you can imagine back in ancient times, people being terrified because it is quite scary, isn't it? To see this unusual phenomenon. And I'll we, tell we you an interesting know. thing. Um, there's a, a symbol that shows up in many ancient cultures across the world. And you'd recognize it if you saw it. I'll try and describe it. It's kind of, it looks like a man doing that hmm. with his arms and his feet pointing out as well. Right. And if it was just that on its own, you'd assume that's what it is. But often it's also depicted with two dots. If you sort of imagine his waist, he's standing there with two hmm. dots, one either side of his waist. Yeah. And... Nobody really knew what it meant. You know, it represents this. It might mean that. Uh, but I, I believe, I don't know how true this is, so take it with a grain of salt, but I believe it's actually been shown that it could be a representation of a plasma form in the upper atmosphere during a very intense geomagnetic storm that you mm. might get this, imagine a cross-section yeah. of a plasma donut. Um, that it may be that and it may be some kind of, you know, it's been passed down through legend and drawn on cave walls and things as, you know, one of these terrible omens in the sky <laughs> kind of thing. But I have found that fascinating that, you know, it's potentially something from space could be recorded like that across eons yeah. of time. You know, I don't know. But uh... Keep banging the drums and chase it away. Yeah, that's all it you works, can do, innit? It works every time. It works with eclipses, so... <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully with Sam's work, you know, yeah, we, yeah. we won't have to, re you know, rely on drums and shouting and shooting fireworks at the sky, you know. We, maybe we'll have warning <laughs> in the future of these kinds of things, you know. That's right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to get a coffee while I've still got time. Yeah, same. I'm going to top my tea uh, up and I'll be back yeah, in a minute. I will, See everyone in a few minutes. Um, I don't know whether you want to uh, keep your screen shared or not. It's, it's up to you, Sam. Um, Normally useful when people ask questions. So I'll, I'll, I'll take yeah. it. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll bring it back up if people when people ask questions. Okay. Um, if you want, I can I can put the uh, space weather forecast on and share that, and uh, or if you want to share it from yours, or um, I've got I've got it up at the moment. Yeah, go on, sure. Okay, I've just sorry. I've just got to get through the cookie warnings. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so let me see. Share that window. Share screen. Space weather. Share. There we go. So uh... right. Can everyone see that? The wrong window. Right. Space where the Met Office, that's the one. There we go. Is that coming through? 
Yeah. Yeah. I'll just leave that up while I go for a coffee and uh, I will see you all in a few minutes. So busy.
I, I've just written Mark uh, Helen and Martin's thanks to the now, <laughs> especially for the splash, the fly splashing. It was, it was splatting. Fuck, there's no other way to say it. <laughs> God knows what it's going to be like tomorrow. I uh, hope it's all, oh. they're all dead. It's yeah. just uh, unbelievable. You just don't expect to open a door. And it literally sounded like rain on um, corrugated steel, you know, corrugated roof. Uh, the noise was horrendous. But uh, i got to say thanks to Chris because uh, he, he was there with me. Um, I was just, uh, no, just going to say, have you got a beekeeper's outfit? That's what we really <laughs> That's it, yeah. <laughs> um, we could do with a, with a mosquito net or something. Yeah. At least we had the face masks on because obviously COVID restrictions and that. We had the face masks on that. I wore my glasses. Yeah. So, But it, it was that end bit where... Uh, At I least it stops you from inhaling any of them. I mean. Well, yeah, you know. <laughs> uh, I had to get up the room Walking because they were actually what? on the on the head oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well you're all hanging about um I did. about 1989 aurora mm. there was also an aurora which was very close on april the 7th in 2000 that's and right is where i took of it oh yes yeah yeah. Visually, did it look similar? Because obviously, camps was, enhanced. It was red. It was green. It was goodness yeah, knows what. Yeah. And um, once again, you could see Cygnus through it. You know, it's amazing, isn't it? Mm. Uh, it's, it, it, I mean, for for us to be able to see this down at the northwest, uh, fifty three degrees or so, it, it's uh, for me. It's uh, only twice in my lifetime I've seen a display like that. 89 was spectacular. I've seen uh, small pillars towards the north, uh, northeast uh, on occasion, but light pollution just uh, ruins that, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Can you see it all right? I know there's... You, we're get, you're getting the reflection. reflection. Yeah. yeah. You're reflecting of all the... Uh, hey, that's that's be better. better. That's good. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It just uh, it was Jeff Regan actually rang up. He said, "I think there's an aurora coming up." You know? I think, yeah, the sky's on fire. There you go, Dave. <laughs> if you just hold it there for a second, yeah. what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you on spotlight, which is going to make your <gasps> image fill the screen. Okay, right. there we go. Oh, that's better. We tilt it back a touch. That's it. Just ah, there. you got it now. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and is that yeah. from your 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 home? It's is it looking Dave? from well, just up the hill, just up the railroad, looking yeah, over yeah. the village. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I know we have our light pollution, but the very fact that you can see it through light pollution is stunning. Imagine yeah. that in a dark sky. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. And I, I uh, actually, um, Ken rang up uh, the uh, BBC Look North. Yeah. And he said, I think I know somebody who took some video of this, meaning me, and of course I didn't. So oh. I, got, I, got, I got a phone call from... Uh, uh, what was her name? Anyway, one of the northern... Um, BBC Northern Sally. Yeah, Remember, yeah. we're still on YouTube and recording yeah. as well. That's it. <laughs> we, we love the BBC. They're great. And uh, yeah, All the channels are available. So so I had uh, people coming, charging around on motorbikes and uh, with cameras and God knows what. Really? Uh, um, just to, just to show them the picture and, and that sort of thing. And he was on Look North following that. <laughs> <laughs> that that's it, isn't it? Instant fame, of course, you know. Yeah. Well, 89, um, I say Mark was only a young lad, he was nine years old at the time. Um, but myself uh, and Mark, we were very much into listening to, at the time, it was, it was Mia Space Station, we used to listen to her on VHF, oh, yes. a little bit of shortwave and whatever. Um, I, I just remember the, the airwaves were just totally knocked out. You couldn't get any reception. It was difficult to uh, you know, pick anything out of the noise, a lot of air. Uh, background noise there um and i i, I was on the radio I, I think i was on radio city um just giving them an update because people were saying the skies are you know lit up and what's going on aliens ooh, <laughs> you know and i just said oh no it's just the northern lights a uh, bit of oral activity um, so it was great it's great fun shall we know. uh get back on to the meeting and, yeah, most uh, humor. yeah now uh, since i spotlighted dave a second ago he may still be full screen for some of you yes, if he is Right, well, okay. You are actually at the moment. <laughs> okay. If you click in the top right of your Zoom window, yeah. you should have the little grid where it says it may yeah. save the word view on it. And if you switch that back to gallery mode, you'll see the entire room okay, again. Yeah. Okay. Right. So um, that brings us 
uh, out of the break, and I'm just bringing my agenda up. Bear with me one second. <laughs> there we go. Um, into part nine, which is questions for the speaker. Uh, so I've, I've written down a few that I've seen as we've gone along. So uh, first one I saw was uh, Matthew Card. Um, has the Parker probe been able to help answer any of these questions? Yes. Um, it's, uh, it's certainly going a, a long way. So, so the Parker Solar Probe and the and Solar Orbiter, again, it's nothing that would be of significant, you know, nothing that I could say that would be like, wow, that's a new discovery. But it certainly goes a long way to sort of gathering data, helping us run simulations and help us understand understand a little bit more of the, the interactions. Because the close, it always turns out that the closer you look, the more complicated it gets. So every time we look a bit closer with a new spacecraft, we find another whole set of physics that, yeah. that we try and understand. So it's, we, the, the, you know, said before, the one of, and I think scientists have said it as well, the, the most interesting thing that can happen when you get a result set is that's not meant to be there. Oh, yeah, yeah. If everything, <laughs> you know? if, if everything went how we originally planned, none of us would have a job anymore. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. It's the, it'll, yeah. So the, in short, short answer is, uh, yeah, we are making a lot of progress with it, but nothing kind of fathomable in a, in a public sense right now. Yeah. More increasing understanding, increasing our parameters, increasing our constraints on all of our models. Yeah. Lovely. Um, the next question I saw was Dave Galvin. Um, do you want to read it out yourself, or do you remember what it was? I do. I've got to read it out. <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing, really, because uh, as a, a well-seasoned amateur astronomer, I should know the answer, and it's certainly something that comes up a lot. So I, I'm, it's not me asking; it's, I'm asking for a friend. Okay. Ah, right. um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> my question is when the magnetic field flips, do we notice any changes such as the magnetic compass pointing the opposite direction? A friend was asking me, honest. Okay, well that honestly that's that's not as silly a question as you think because we, the answer is we don't know. Um so well actually we, we I know the answer to the compass question, which is if if we the magnetic field flips, compasses would point the other direction. Yeah. But the thing about the, the last time the magnetic field flipped was probably 10,000 years ago or something. So nothing that we've ever been able to record. But the reason we know about it is because we can look at ice cores. So um, what happens is the the way, because the, mag the magnetic field affects a lot of kind of how certain minerals align in rocks and all, lots of different things that I don't understand. But we, as the ice from Antarctica, for example, is layered up over, over years and years, we can dig out the cores and look at the fact that these poles are flipped and we really don't understand very much about that at all uh, because mainly because it's not in terms of a research priority it's not that high but of course it's really interesting so what we do know is that um it's irregular um as far as we can tell because i think the last time it happened so just thinking about i think the jurassic period um we think it happened about 20 or so times over the course of 10,000 years. But then before that, it didn't happen once for about 100,000 years or something like that. So we we really don't understand it. But in terms of the, the effects it would have, um, we know, of course, that life itself can be can sustained through a, a, magn a flip of the magnetic poles because it's happened many times while life has existed. The problem would be the our infrastructure, uh, as we've talked. So as... You know, d does the magnetic field does it disappear and then reappear? If if that was the case, we'd be in big trouble technologically because we we'd be we're getting directly battered by the solar wind. Um, but or does it slowly move? We think it might slowly move because the North Pole, for example, the magnetic north moves all the time on a yearly basis by a few meters. Um, so, and then the question is then, can we understand that by looking at other planets like like Uranus, for example, which is is on its side. So, what what does a magnetic field look like that is kind of tilted a little bit? Um, but I guess to answer your original question, yeah, we would see the the, the compasses flip. But other than that, we don't really know much else. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, a, not, it's, it's, it's a really good question. Yeah. But we, 
Yeah. You can't answer it. I'll, I'll make sure I pass this on to my friend when, yeah. when I see him. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was thinking it's... migration of, you know, of birds. I know, it, it, you know some birds will you know, use uh, the moon, like the full moonlight. Uh, yeah. as navigation but if, if they re- any animals that rely on uh, the magnetic field then that's gonna you know <laughs> it's not it's not gonna be overnight and that's the important thing is it? it's gonna be a progression so uh, that's so. another question though is you know would it be that fast would it be overnight would the field suddenly go thump, or is it very gradual most, most likely will happen over, or... yeah mo- most likely that yeah. But again, and does it stay intact the whole time, or do do you get three North Poles floating around near each other, and you know three South Poles at the opposite side, and they're all swirling about, and eventually it all mingles back together yeah. into the upside down field? These are all you know? great questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, in ten thousand years' time, we will know. <laughs> Thanks we'll have you back Sam. <laughs> in six months with the answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep watching the planets. Thanks. Um, I've got a question. Um, yeah. Can I just pick up one more last thing I was going to say on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I think with the animals, we uh, again, this is scraping the barrel of my knowledge right now, but I think we, we're aware of some animals that do use magnetic fields to navigate. I'm not sure which, you'll have to Google it, but if that was something you're interested in reading more about, it's definitely worth a look. Cool. Um. What was mine? Uh, are you looking forward to getting your hands on that data from the Parker probe? Um, so I am a uh, so I'm a radiation belt physicist. So Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter aren't going to do anything for me. But I work very closely with solar physicists who are very, very, very excited. So they so we have whole PhDs. Uh, so you know, three, four year pieces of research which are just in order to prepare for that data. So what, what we know we're, we're expecting from it, you know, building models, building things ready to input um, that data into. And we've already got some data, to be honest, because as soon as it launched, things were getting switched on, things were getting tested. And we're also, it's orbiting the sun anyway. So we're getting another perspective on, on data that we kind of already understand. And then yeah. in a few years time, so it's going to take a few years to get close to the sun, but then in a few years time, that's when the real the real exciting yeah. brand new data will start coming. What would your ideal satellite or probe be? Presumably something that can sit in the Van Allen belt so, undamaged, recording that's, things. That is, I've never been asked that question before <laughs> in one of these talks. It, it's a great question because it's it's something that I'll probably have to answer in, in work. To, so we're constantly writing. Obviously, I haven't done it myself because I'm the only student at the minute, but you know, my supervisor, professors, constantly writing proposals for new missions most of them get rejected but every now and again one gets accepted so what i want to understand about the van allen radiation belts is how is the balance between these injection processes which really pump up and energize them and the loss processes which cause them to become yeah. lost yeah and what you need for that so i, I showed um a, a video of the angle at which uh you point a, an electron in a magnetic field and it, and it spirals around. So what we want is to look at those different angles of the particles in the radiation belts very specifically. We can do that with certain spacecraft like Van Allen, the Van Allen probes, which you might have heard of. So the most recent radiation belt based spacecraft, but that is based at more higher. So in right in the, in the heart of the belt. So mainly looking at particles that are, are trapped, are still trapped there. What I wanted, would love to do is get a spacecraft that stays low so it can see both the trapped particles that are bouncing and the ones that are also going to hit go down to the Earth, which doesn't exist yet. We've, we've tried to kind of extract that information from other spacecraft. In fact, I've spent a lot of time in the last few years doing that. Um, and there are other missions which might go some way to help us, but the ideal mission for me would be a, a low-altitude spacecraft which can measure a range of different energies of electrons at different angles and in different directions, essentially. Um, yeah. And it's got to be hardy enough to survive it. Yeah, of course. So, and work so correctly. The, well. the, because these satellites pass through, because of the nature of the orbits, they pass through every few hours, they're heavily shielded, they're built for this kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that is a because of, there's a lot of um, instruments that... So the instrument I have been working with for most of my PhD is an instrument called Sampex. You might be you, you can Google it and read about it, but it's a, it, it, it launched in 1992, uh, ended in 2012, 
and the instruments on there we assumed were measuring a particular um, particular energy range. In 2015, um, someone came along and re recalibrate not recalibrated but looked at all the different streams of data and worked out that actually because of the energy levels that we're seeing it's kind of it's tripping all the detectors all the time so the, the data is a, is kind of a, looking at different things than what we originally thought so it is yeah these are problems and and the thing with spacecraft is that um it, we we really can't simulate that we, we can simulate it to an extent but we we build an instrument based on our own understanding and, yeah. and when it's up there we just hope it works <laughs> so, yeah <laughs> uh, and yeah uh I, I, we're live on YouTube, but, but but I suppose it doesn't matter. Most um, instruments that we send up are actually nowhere near what we would want them to be. You know, the initial proposal. Oh. The initial yeah. proposal is is you know, I want the everything we ever want. Well, let's say you have to overshoot for what you what you want and what you need. Exactly. Yeah. So so oh, there's so, there's so much we could do with with more spacecraft. <laughs> yeah. Um, better instruments. Yeah, uh, we've got a question from Johnny. Do you want to read yours, yours out, Johnny? Yeah, it was. Um, so is there, has, with the data, has it been spotted, like any correlation between the weather and space and like the weather and Earth? The, the one that I've spotted myself um, is the one in um, the solar maximum, the 60s, like the big one. It's it's at the same time we had the, the the big freeze on Earth, and was just wondering is that just a coincidence, or is there anything to support that sort no, of? Uh... That that's a good question. Yeah. So the example you gave will be just a coincidence because the space weather can't affect climate that much. You know, the the biggest influence on climate is 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 very obviously the stuff that we're pumping into the atmosphere, but the space weather does have a very minimal impact on local climates. So um if you have a, a, a very, so for example electrons can damage ozone um there's an area of space called the south atlantic anomaly um which is in the south atlantic uh, so that gets an increased amount of so if, if you spend a lot of time there you have an inc you have an increased risk of ca of getting cancer skin cancer because of the damaged ozone because of the amount of electrons that are um Hitting, hitting that. Um, what, what's causing that anomaly? What, it's because, where does it come from? So I showed you the diagram of the Earth and its magnetic field. Um, what it is, I'm just going to share my screen again. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's relatively simple if you've just got, if I've got a diagram. Um, where are we? Where's our... Um... Okay, so this is our magnetic field. Um this is this looks perfectly symmetrical. So this is the South Atlantic Atlantic anomaly down here, and this is where some of these these field lines hit the Earth. So that's also where some of the electrons are going to hit. In reality, the magnetic field is slightly shifted off in that direction, which means that this part of the magnetic field is a little bit closer. So there's a there's a so this part of where the radiation belts Van Allen belts would be is closer. So you're going to get so there's a massively enhanced amount of electrons hitting the atmosphere, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, the South Atlantic anomaly that it, it can damage ozone um, and it microclimate. I, I, this is not my area of expertise, but there is um, a guy called Craig Roger who's based in New Zealand who does a little bit of that, and it can influence local climates by you know ten, 10 percent of the local temperature. Um, which again, I must stress. But being being a kind of a scientist, I must stress that this is pale nothing compared to uh, human made climate change. But space weather um, does have a very minimal effect on on local climate patterns. Yeah, but it's a good question because there is research going on there. Carry on, sorry. Thanks. Can I can I just ask one question? Um, of course. You know, uh, you you showed us a picture of the total solar eclipse yeah. with the various coronal. Uh, uh, streamers yeah. right. um, they uh, in my because I'm, I'm a bit of a, an eclipse maniac as well um, they seem to suggest from what I gather that the uh, the long streamers which you get appear at a minimum at a solar minimum whereas if it's a, if it's tightly surrounding 
the sun. It's a, it's a maximum. Now, could you explain why this happens, or is it not your? your um, so a little bit. So what? So what you're saying is the so the stream is. Can, can, is, can you repeat it just so I can process it a the, bit more? Well, the solar streamers, they, they, uh, from the equator, go, uh, you know, spread for many millions of miles and so on. But, and, and then, of course, you've got the polar uh, streamers as well. Yeah. But yeah. when you get the... Um, uh, I suppose the, what, the, the crux yeah. of the question you know is the, the magnetic field of the sun... Yes. Is is different at minimum than maximum. Yes, yes. Yeah. I think okay. that, I think that more or less. Exactly. But again, I so, will tell you what, you, you you're giving me a good workout tonight because you're asking some, <laughs> some great questions. I'm, I'm just um, wondering why it's that the the uh, corona is very tightly bound around the sun. Yeah. That's so the maximum. You would think it'd be the other way around. Yeah. So so this this is again. I am scraping the barrel. I'll admit because I'm not a solar physicist, but. This is related to the to the plot um, that I showed you. This one, the bottom one of the the uh, the sunspots. So as the solar cycle goes on, these tend to appear closer to the closer to the equator. And yeah, you're right. You're right that the that the magnetic field here. So the, these polar regions, um, as the cycle goes on, these these. <laughs> Can't remember which way around it is. Whether as the cycle goes on, they squeeze into so that the poles essentially become bigger, or whether it's the other way around. Um, why that happens, I I couldn't even begin to, to explain. And you get um, into sort of magneto hydrodynamics and yes, plasma uh, physics. And... Magneto hydrodynamics is a, a basically Obviously that's a, a minimum. That's a minimum eclipse. Yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. apologies for inter interrupting, I think uh, Dave, like myself, we've seen quite a few eclipses, Dave, I've seen about four or five, you've probably seen more, I think, um, and each ten. total eclipse, you've seen <laughs> ten, whoa, that's a lot of minutes in shadow, oh. as we always say, umbra file, I think we are, aren't we? <laughs> There's a term for us. Um, but each eclipse, each total eclipse is unique to itself, because every time oh. you go, the magnetic field is different. And you, Which is why you want to see another one. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So we, we've we've been to eclipses where the the, uh, the 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 corona is way out there, following the magnetic fields, and other times it's tight. And it, it's amazing that when you see these images, obviously that's that image that you've shown is well processed to enhance uh, the detail and the the yeah. field lines. Uh, visually, yeah. we don't see it that sharp, of course. But yeah, you know, you, you do see the the corona. It's sort of it's small, tight, or it's quite. Spectacular. Yeah, that depends on the activity. So, yeah, like you said, if you've got a really active sun, so near the peak of the solar cycle, the solar wind's getting thrown out much faster, yeah. um, much higher densities. So, and it's a lot clearer. You get to a minimum, and like you said, I've never seen a solar eclipse. So, I, oh, oh, well, well you've you got to get out there. Twenty twenty four out of the states. Seen, yeah, I've seen the partial Mexico, one. I think. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've seen the partial right across, one right across the states. That's yeah, it. There are loads of people went to Argentina. What happens very often, actually, is that we have a scientific and international conferences often mm. try and coincide with them. So <laughs> I've not, I've not managed to get to one yet. But um, yeah. you've got to work. You've got to work. You need this data for your uh, research, of course. Yeah. Well, that's what we tell yeah, us. Yeah. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I think it's called Plan Ahead. That's the one. That's the, That's it, Dave. Yeah. So, any other questions? Uh, well, I, I, I'm thinking about. Um, I was thinking further afield into other solar systems. You know, we, we, we're seeing. Uh, we, you know, we, we, I was thinking of uh, the, the effect of on the weather on the Earth from gravitational waves. I, I know it's slightly off tangent, but when we have two neutron stars that collapse or collide, we get these gravitational waves. Or when a star explodes, it sends out a shock wave, and we, we see these ripple effects. Um, 1987 San Juliac. 1987a i think it was a supernova and over the decades since we can actually see these rings rippling out from that sh oh, shock waves and that has an effect right across the universe so, you know into the, oh, yes. the galaxy so and i always think everything it's butterflies wings so whether the sun has a little burp or a hiccup it must affect our atmosphere uh, whether a star explodes or a neutron star collapses into another it's 
has these rippling effects and that must affect the solar wind it must affect the radiation received by the earth and so on so on so many variations and variables involved in your data research I think. yeah oh yeah and so you can't account for everything that, you know that's that's another great question so slightly we, <laughs> off the topic i do apologize I know, it's more on topic than you actually realize because the Thank so the sun, the sun has its own magnetic field as we know if you zoom right out it looks like kind of like the earth's but in, in interstellar space instead of in, in the solar system. Um, but funny you should say about the cosmic rays and the, so the, from a super, so the gravitational waves, I've no idea. So I'm not going to pretend to understand that. So, but the, yeah, the cosmic, rays, <laughs> yeah, the cosmic rays that come from uh, solar events. So what I'm just going to share my screen again. Um, where are we? There, so there's two Van Allen radiation belts. So, one of them is the outer belt, which I've mainly been talking about today. The other one is this inner belt, which is a bit further in. So the outer belt is probably from about a few hundred kilometers out to a few tens of thousand. The inner belt is about is between, you know, hundred to a few hundred kilometers. Um, and this is not generated. This is, these are kind of not relevant to the, to our solar system. What happens is when you get a cosmic ray from a supernova or a, or any kind of event from from outside of the solar system, which releases radiation, a lot. Though, so there's this thing we have called um, cosmic ray albedo neutron decay, and we say CRAND um, as the acronym. And what that means is new, high energy neutrons from outside of the solar system hit the atmosphere, um, and they interact with our atmosphere, and they do something called um, well, the neutron decay where they, the neutron decays into a proton and a neutrino. So this is a bit of particle physics kind of thing. And then that, that proton then bounces off our atmosphere and then becomes trapped in our magnetic field in the same way we said before. Uh, it starts spinning around. So our, the inner radiation belt, which is very close to Earth, is an, almost entirely made up of, of protons that originated in cosmic supernova outside the solar system, um, which is perfectly relevant. So... <laughs> um, <laughs> But the thing is, you don't hear much about the inner belt is because it's really stable. It, very, mm. it doesn't vary that much at all. It's very predictable. Um, but yeah, all those protons essentially come from, come from originate in, in supernovas and, and neutron stars, you know, all, all, all the rest of it. Yeah, it's uh, amazing. Uh, it's so involved, isn't it, really? Yeah. Uh, I, I was just texting a message uh, to Mark, another question if, uh, if I could. The uh, International um, <laughs> Space Station, I, I was thinking. Sorry, Mark. I, no, I was just going to say, I know Sam has uh, things to do. So uh, course, we, yeah. if, if nobody else has got any other questions, we'll make this the last one. If anybody else does have another question, we'll make well, you know, these the last two. Um, so have a, have a quick think amongst yourselves. If anyone's got one final question to ask, we'll do Dave's very quickly. And uh, <laughs> go on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try to make it quick and clear. Um, the International Space Station um, altitude, some of the reason of 200 to 220 miles above the Earth's uh, surface. Um, what about the radiation belts, uh, the Van Allen belts? I don't know what altitude that they're at, but obviously uh, radiation, uh, certainly from the sun, solar energy, uh, affects the the altitude of the sun, uh, basically of the uh, space station, because it has to keep altering um, and, and increasing its altitude uh, constantly. And of course, the dangers involved. And I, yeah, yeah. I believe the astronauts had to cram themselves into the center yeah. to uh, yeah. reduce the uh, the possible of radiation damage. So this is um, a bit of a sorry. So I've got another talk on the Van Allen belts, which goes into a lot of detail on that. So it's right, a good we'll have you back on that. I think we will <laughs> definitely be having you back for that one. Yeah. So the radiation <laughs> is definitely a big risk. So so. In the the ISS, astronauts very often come back with a suntan or sunburn because because of the radiation that they really? are. Posted. Wow! Yeah, so the space the space station is is obviously protected, um, but they are subject to an increased amount of radiation because they're regularly passing through the the both belts, but very briefly. So it's not an immediate danger, but it's definitely it has to be monitored. Um, the Apollo missions, however. They were very, very lucky because they, when you look at what we understand about geomagnetic activity now, there was a, there was a particular solar, solar storm event in between two of the Apollo missions that had those astronauts been on the moon or on their way to the moon, it would have 
pro it would have killed them all because um, you would have needed immediate medical attention, essentially. So it is a big, it is back then, obviously, we didn't understand the risk quite as much, but because um, that's when this, this, this field of space plasma is kind of birthed in, in around about the 50s and 60s. Um, I don't know whether any, I don't want to give any spoilers. There's a series called For All Mankind, um, which covers um, the space race and if some decisions had been taken differently, that's I won't give any more spoilers than that. But mm. one scene in it depicts astronauts <clears throat> on the moon and it's the mid 1970s or early 1980s, if I remember right, um, which may give you a, a clue that the space program has gone a little differently in this program. Um, they're on the moon exposed during a solar storm yeah. and the effects that that has on them. Um, but sorry, back to Sam. <laughs> it's, but yeah, it, it's a good program. Yeah. yeah, that is yeah, good example of what can happen. It, it could render a bunch of astronauts on the moon, um, you know, needing immediate serious medical attention. And, and uh, obviously passing through the Van Allen belts is fine because you only get a few, a few minutes, if that, of exposure. Um, kind of like the people in the ISS do. But when you're out in the open space, you're subject to everything coming from the sun. So you've got no protection from the, from the magnetic, mm. magnetic field. Yeah. So it, and galactic yeah. cosmic rays as well. I mean, are they mm. as, as serious a danger as the solar? Yes, yeah, they are. They, but less, again, less common. So they can... Yeah. So there's back. less of them, but they're going that much faster because of the distances that they've traveled or uh, I, do they carry more energy is what i suppose what i'm asking um mm. not no, not in comparison to what's in it because the proton the pro the inner proton belt from the cosmic rays it builds up over time and it's very right. stable so, so there's not you haven't got these erratic events going on like you would in in the outer belt but yeah. uh yeah it just shows the the wide range of effects that you can that this has why we need to think about it basically it's it's going to you know at some point whether it be 10 years 100 years we're going to have a situation kind of like good, uh -huh. where everyone mm -hmm. everyone kind of ignores it because it's not going to happen then all of a sudden yeah. we're all locked down for two years do you, do you know what i mean um yeah. and the scale of effects from a solar storm well there'd, there'd be yeah. less deaths initially, initially but in terms of the impact on our lives much much greater than than the pandemic yeah yeah, two quick points on that, Sam and Mark. Uh, one you is the, the, the I know I'm going, I'm going as quick as I can. I think you've spoken as much as Sam has tonight. I know, but I, I find this fascinating, and I do apologise as always. Um, basically, uh, Apollo missions right through from eleven right through to seventeen. Fortunately, it was all done during the uh, solar uh, minimum. It was, wasn't maximum, so therefore the very very few solar flares to uh, be concerned. Plus, our knowledge at that time wasn't that great of solar flares. It's only since Skylab 74 onwards that we got that knowledge. Uh, the other thing being is you mentioned um, solar radiation, uh, sorry, uh, galactic you, you, you know, radiation, uh, gamma rays and so on. That was um, recorded, but not knowingly, as flashing of lights when they were on board the space capsules and they, oh, the the Apollo, phosphines and they, they were seeing flashes, boom, 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 sparks, and it wasn't understood, but it was uh, basically uh, gamma rays hitting the retina and just, yeah. yeah because because the astronauts rec recorded saying, did you see that? What, did I see what? The flash. Oh, that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah fast. No, I, I, I'm, it. I'm <laughs> muting. <laughs> no, it's really nice to have loads of high level questions as well, actually. But you wouldn't believe some of the things people ask <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh... so is there anybody else with questions? Is that everybody? Right. Okay. So uh, I'll move on to the vote of thanks. Uh, so Sam, what a fascinating talk! Um, it goes to show how important research such as yours is, and uh, it's not all about predicting a nice light show for astronomers. Uh, but in a very real way, it could save equipment and, more importantly, people's lives, not only around the world, but beyond the world. Um, I'd like to thank you for speaking for us this evening, uh, your afternoon, <laughs> and especially for using up your lunchtime in the middle of a very, very busy day for you. Um, so would everybody please join me in giving Sam a round of applause? Oh. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
fascinating. <laughs> fascinating. Well, this, again, th thank you for for having me. Um, thank you for so many really good questions. I think this is definitely up there with the taking me to a higher level than I ever thought I could get at one of these talks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, no, again, if, if you're interested, I've got another talk on specifically. Oh, definitely. So, yeah. Definitely. I'll be in touch soon to book you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Kareem, oh, sure. I've got a friend out in, in Canada, in Ottawa. Um, he, he basically, he's, uh, he's a local astronomical society. He's also astrophysicist or whatever. And I think he would love to have you do a talk for their local society. Uh, okay. Could I pass your details on to him? Would that be okay? Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I'm um, I'm all over the place in the next few months. I'm, I'm I know the feeling. I know the feeling. So, I'll yeah. put you in touch. Yeah. So <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. If you've got plenty of warning, that I can normally fit people in. Where That's okay. He's only down the road from you. you down know. the road, <laughs> five hours from, away. From here to Ottawa is bigger than the size of the UK. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> in this day and age, it's nothing. Thank yeah. you. Right. Okay, uh, item 11 on the agenda, the date of the next meeting, which is also going to be held online on Zoom. Um, that will be on Friday, the 15th of October, when we'll have Andy Briggs joining us from Spain with his talk, How to Photograph a Black Hole. Now, I can see some of you wondering, didn't we already have a talk about that? We did. Uh, however, this talk offers a different perspective, and I think you will enjoy it. <laughs> okay, uh, so item 12, meeting close, it's 21.10, and now we're going to stop the YouTube stream, and we're going to stop recording. And just before I do, I'd like to say thank you to everybody who's been on YouTube and in Zoom tonight. Uh, we had about... oh. Let's see. Well, the Zoom stream has already had 31 playbacks, even though it hasn't finished yet. Sorry, the YouTube stream. And we've had around about 40 people in the Zoom room tonight. So a pretty good turnout. Excellent. Right. I will uh, bear with me one second. I have to click a few windows. I will say goodbye to everyone on YouTube now. And...